So, good afternoon. Welcome uh, to this conversation about what's happening to IPOs, which I'm delighted to be moderating. I'm Zanny minton Beddoes from The Economist. Um, and just to set the scene a bit, the, the, I, the kind of what's going on with IPOs is very interesting depending on where you look. Globally, IPOs are actually doing extremely well. The public markets are doing extremely well. If you look at the US, however, and um, broadly, the number of IPOs is essentially halved between the last few years and the sort of 1990s, early 2000s. Number as a result, in part, the number of listed companies in the US has halved. And this is in part because the most exciting companies, of which we have one, uh, one member here, are staying private for longer. And what we want to have a discussion about this afternoon, I think, is two broad themes. One is, why is this happening? What's going on? Is it because the regulatory and compliance costs of going public are so prohibitive, the last thing you want to do is go public? Or is it, and or is it, because there are so many alternative sources of capital now, whether it's private equity, whether it's venture capital, whether it's you know, um, sovereign wealth funds, whether it's initial coin offerings, you know, 2.5 billion raised in ICOs, in 20, most of it in 2017. Um, so that's one set of questions. And then I think after that, I'd like to also ask a bit of a sort of Davosian question, if you will, which is, um, what does all this mean for firms, for shareholders, and for capitalism? If we have a market that the sort of public markets were essentially one of the kind of bases of modern shareholder driven capitalism and thus for the underpinnings of the modern market economy. And so if we're moving away from that, what are those consequences? So those broadly were the, the, the two themes that I wanted to push. To do that, a fantastic panel. Um, very briefly to introduce them over there. I don't quite know how I do this in a circle, but anyway, over there, <laughs> Tony Fernandez, CEO of AirAsia, the largest airline in Malaysia, done several IPOs and I think planning to do some more. So we'll hear the perspective of someone who's been involved in that and hopes to do some more. Then next to him, Abidali Nimuchwala, um, CEO of Wipro, who, and Wipro have just bought uh, Aperio for 500 million. So they're big corporates buying, doing big investments in other corporates, so the big play investment, which saves the others going public. So that's the alternative perspective. Next to him, Bill Ford, CEO of General Atlantic, which is, of course, the private equity VC perspective coming from you. Here to my left, Matthew Prince, co-founder and CEO of Cloudfare. Uh, Cloudfare, officially unicorn, a valuation of more than a billion. I don't know what the latest valuation is. I'll leave that to you to tell people. but. You have not, uh, you're not gone public yet, and I'm sure we'll find out whether you're planning to. And then when he turns up, and I think he's been a little bit delayed, Tom Farley, president and CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, who will no doubt have a strong perspective on, on uh, what's going on here. So let's start, um, let's start with you, Bill. And why don't you give us a sense of why you think this is happening in the US in particular? Why have we had such a slowdown in the number of IPOs? Sure. Thanks, Zany. Thanks for having me here. Um, I, I would say a, a couple of points. One, actual. Oh, brilliant! You just oh, missed hey, my. It was a very long, erudite <laughs> introduction where I said how absolutely wonderful you were. Um, Tom Farley, President and CEO of the New York hey. Stock Exchange. Hey, Tom. How are you? Um, you know, one one comment to make is that actual the, the actual volume of IPOs by dollar volume last year was up almost fifty percent. So actually, twenty seventeen was a good year for US IPOs, but what we've seen is, is I think, a, a real decline in the small cap IPO. And that's been going on for 10 plus years, maybe even longer. And, and I think it's because of three basic reasons. You know, one is a, a massive increase in the amount of private capital that's available to invest in high quality private companies. There's only over a trillion dollars of uninvested private equity. There's a, probably another trillion of sovereign wealth and family capital that, that's interested in growth companies. Um, the, the second is, uh, and I, I hope we hear from this from Tom on this topic, but the regulatory burden. Uh, if you go all the way back to Sarbanes-Oxley through Dodd-Frank, um, the, the, the cost of being a public company has gone up dramatically, and, and the, the, all the issues around compliance. And I think that, that's been you know, a significant issue. And, then, and the third one is one that maybe doesn't get talked about as much, but I think is significant, is, is really the change in the economics of the equity trading business. If you go back into the, into the 90s, which was sort of the peak of the small cap IPO market, uh, many of the investment banks who were underwriting these IPOs were able to enjoy very significant trading profits uh, for these small cap companies. And, and that allowed them to pay for research, for market making, and really caused them to pursue it. But with decimalization and, and real change at the investment banks, uh, there's very, very, very little desire to really spend money on research and, 
and on, on equity market making anymore for companies that have a cap, let's say, below two or three billion dollars. So why don't we go through those individually? Because you've set up the structure brilliantly, and let's start. Um, but let's start not with the sources of capital. Let's start with the regulatory burden, um, the costs of compliance. And Tony, you you you've taken companies public, and you're thinking about taking more companies public. Uh, have it, have you taken any public in the U.S.? Actually. Tom has been trying to get me to do that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, so interesting. So, he, you know, he gave how me do you... one of the most amazing proposals I've ever seen from a stock exchange, and I, he should be congratulated for his amazing marketing ability. We want to be, I mean, we're a fan of the public market, and, and both positive and negative, and we'd love to be in the NYSE. Going back to Bill's point on the, you know, the, the whole regulatory issue and the litigation, litigious kind of. Uh, issues that come out kind of scared us, but we, we think that's something we're going to work through with, with Tom. Um, I think, going back to me, I mean, I started this airline, and I bought the airline for 25 cents and uh, with two planes, and now we've grown to 220 planes. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do that without the public markets. And uh, we listed our, our airline in 2004, and it's been great. But you see the problems uh, arising in the public market, the volatility, the short-termism, um, you know, two, two years ago, my stock price was 70 cents. Today, it's, uh, it's at a record at 4.14. Um, how does a, we haven't changed fundamentally uh, dramatically in those two years. That, I think, is one of the problems. Private investors have a much longer term view, and it's much easier to manage. Well, I don't know, I haven't worked with Bill, but I assume it's easier to manage Bill than hundreds and hundreds of uh, <laughs> Fidelities and Wellingtons, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Nick Nash says so anyway. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so um, he's, he's not an IPO on the other side. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, he's an American citizen. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to get Tom to respond in a second. Yeah. But is the US worse than everywhere else in terms of, do you, get, do you have those same concerns Outside the it office. is, in my opinion, it is the toughest, you know, and I, I can't go into the history, etc. and there may be legitimate reasons for it, but when you're asking as to why we aren't, those are the concerns, and I, you know, Bill said I think the, the, the present administration is trying to address some of those things, but I mean, it is the best market to be in, it's the best market to be in for visibility, capital, etc. but these things hold us back, and, and hopefully those will be sold in, in due course. But my main issue with the public markets are the short-termism. Um, you know, for an airline such as ours, it, it took us many years to develop Indonesia, it took us many years to develop the Philippines, and we were hammered by the stock market. We stuck our ground because I'm a stubborn son of a bitch, and I said, I'm not going to, you know, the analysts were saying, close it down, close it down, close it down. Now, both these airlines are worth in excess of a, a billion. Uh, so that, I think, is not something the New York Stock Exchange or anyone can address, coupled with the fact that private investors are giving phenomenal valuations. I sit here for growth companies. I sit here and I look at, you know, we, we carry 89 million people. We have en enormous data. But a, a similar company in Matthew's area from a tech field would get 80 times valuation, and I'm getting three or four times. So private investors are viewing things differently from public investors and have a much longer term view. And I think those are the issues coupled with regulatory, coupled with you know, th profit records and all kinds of new things that come up, which I think deters uh, companies from looking at the private equity market. They're, they're all really good points. And we're going to get to the short termism um, in a minute. But I just, Tom, let me ask, ask you to respond to that, to the, the issue of regulatory and compliance costs and, you know, I think there is a general view that they've gone up in the US, that it's now a competitive issue in the US. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, and what are you doing about it? And how are you going to persuade Tony to So, sure, and, and thank you for that. And first, let me, just, let me just echo what Bill said. The IPO business in the US is exceedingly healthy. Um, for example, through January, uh, January of this year will, will likely be the biggest one we've ever had in the history of the New York Stock Exchange in terms of proceeds raised. In fact, may well already. But not in terms of number of companies. No, that's where I'm going to go. That's where I was going to go. Um, uh, uh, and we likely will have five IPOs raising $700 million or greater the first time ever uh, in the history of New York Stock Exchange. But to your point, the number of public companies is down by close to half over, over 20 years, while the aggregate market cap is up by three and a half times. So the average company is six or seven times bigger than it was. It's a very healthy market if you're a big company. What does that mean for a small company? It means there's a lot more regulatory costs. Let me broaden the, the scope. 
of regulatory costs. It's not just the costs that came with Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank, which are kind of strictly speaking regulatory costs, more internal audit, more compliance, so on and so forth. It's also the rise of the activist investor. Mm. The, the number of activist campaigns is increasing all around the world by about 100 to 150 per year. Last year, there was close to 600 bona fide activist campaigns, many of which were in America, and shareholder class action lawsuits. So in the US, we've had uh, around about 3,500 shareholder class action lawsuits over the last 10 years. And in other regimes, you don't have shareholder class action lawsuits. I just came from a meeting of the uh, head of state in Hong Kong. They don't have shareholder class action. In London, it's enabled. Uh, or allowed, but there's very, there's very, very few. So the costs are significant. But, and then I'll, I'll conclude, if you come list there, like Nick did or Mark's done several times, you are, holding, you are holding yourself out to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, which is going to have high regulatory standards. It actually has high standards to be able to list your company. And there's a benefit to that. It attracts capital. It attracts liquidity. There's a reason why we have $40 trillion in market cap Whereas the other exchanges I mentioned, great exchanges, London is three or four trillion. Hong Kong, less than that. So if you list your company there, you're going to have tighter spreads, lower transaction costs. Your currency is going to be easier to use when you go do transactions. There's pros and there's cons, and that's how I look at it. And actually, some of that scrutiny may not be a bad thing for corporate governance as well. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But, but Matthew, from your perspective, you are... You know, your company is large. It might perhaps in a different era have thought about going public earlier. Clearly now hasn't yet. Tell us as a, as a, as a co-founder, as a tech entrepreneur, why have you decided not to go public yet? And what's, what's the, when you listen to this, which of the causes resonates most with you? Well, I think certainly uh, there's, there's plenty of access to capital. And, you know, if we needed to raise private capital tomorrow, there would be probably people in this room that would be happy to, to write us a check uh, for that. I, I think there's a time and a place for things as companies mature. Uh, when we first got started, you know, there were three of us above a nail salon in Palo Alto. Um, and at that time, we didn't have formal audits. We didn't have a board. We didn't have all of those things. Uh, and then we, then we raised capital from other people, from private venture capital investors. And we started to do things like have board meetings and and then we you know, grew larger and we raised capital from other people. We started having you know, formal audits. Um, today, you know, our last round was led by Fidelity, actually, and uh, back in, in 2014. And we started doing mock earnings calls to practice to get ready to be a public company. And I think that you know, we've always thought that that was the path that we were on. And at some point, um, I think you do have to move out of your parents' basement, effectively. Uh, and so we're headed down that path. And, uh, but we, we want to do it at the right time. And we've built a good enough business that we don't have to go public. You know, there are two reasons you go public, either because you have to, you've run out of other sources of private capital, or because you want to. And you know, back in 99, in a former life, I was a, I was a securities attorney. I worked on six IPOs in one summer, and it was fun. And you know, I, uh, I, you know, someday might be ringing a bell or pushing a button. But I, again, I think there's a time and a place, and the availability of capital right now has allowed good companies to pick and choose what that time and place is. So the availability of capital means you haven't had to, but it sounds from the tone of your remarks that at some point you might want to. Why will you want to list? What is it that you will want to get out of it? Well, I think, you know, I think we have a duty to the people who've invested in us, both in terms of capital that they've provided to us, and then our employees in terms of the time that they've put into the company. And everyone who is an employee at Cloudflare is an owner of Cloudflare. And so we want to make sure that we can return that to them. And, um, and so, you know, again, there's... We've, Michelle and I have always, have always thought of this as we're sort of climbing an infinitely tall mountain. And we would rather take lots of little steps than sort of one big step to get up that mountain. But going public is you know, a big step in and of itself, which is why we've been for now a year and a half doing mock earnings calls every quarter with actual analysts listening in on them and, and doing the things to get ready so that when we do you know, stand up there and ring the bell, it's less of a big change at the company, and again, it's a smaller incremental change. So it's, it's, it's essentially access to liquid markets so that your employees can 
Did, can, I, yes, just, can I just dive in on one thing? Yeah. You said the, another benefit is that shareholders can make different choices post-IPO, meaning Matthew may choose to stay in for the long haul for the full mountain climb, but there may be some other investors or early employees who say, I'd like to get liquidity. And I think one, one thing that versus selling a company's entirety you get from an IPO is this ability to make different choices, shareholders make right. different choices. And I think that's a, a really valuable tool for a company like Cloudflare. Now, there are private markets, and NYC and others have done things to create that liquidity without an IPO. But it, at the same point, you know, uh, we have competitors that have a lower cost of capital than we do because they can access the public markets. Um, you can attract a different caliber of employees because you, you, know, you have a, a, some sort of a liquid stock. So there, there are real benefits. And, and again, m maybe more than anything else, it's, it's just this is what you do as you build a larger company to show that you're credible, to go through the regulatory hurdles. Yeah, they're costly. But you know that there's there's a real purpose and a benefit for that, and that cost then gives people who are you know trusting their capital with us that that we have controls in place so, that we so have it's those a things. Badge of growing up. I mean, yeah. but the basement analogy is rather good. You know, yeah. kids move out of their parents' basements like at older yeah. ages yeah. now. So, but at you some know, point the, they eventually do. The other one is that it's it's almost like you know you, when you when you share a company is like playing with a toy boat in the bathtub. And then maybe it you know, graduates to the swimming pool and then to the local pond and eventually to the lake. You know, I think that we're now to the point where we want to go out on the harbor, but I'm not sure we're quite ready for the North Atlantic. Right? And so I think that that's the question is, how do you, how do you take those, those little steps? And there's, there's something very different about being kind of a $1 to $10 billion company to being a $500 billion company. And, and the public markets don't totally differentiate between that. But we're trying to think through how to create governance structures to, to I, I want to get to that at some point, how the public markets treat those. But I mean, let's turn to you, because you uh, are coming at this from a different direction, which is you are probably one of the reasons why some tech companies haven't had to go public, because you come in with a very large capital infusion and buy them. So from your perspective, do you think differently now about investments in a way that is a sort of secular change for, for these companies so they don't have to IPO? Yeah, so you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it from two perspectives. One is we IPO'd at the New York Stock Exchange and there was value to it at a time. Of course, there is a cost of governance and today we are an $8 billion company, but when we IPO'd, we are an order of magnitude smaller. But uh, access to the US market, while a lot of things about regulation and the inconvenience we can call, but there is a value to the corporate governance and uh, a listing in a US stock exchange provides you, especially when US is a large market for you, to be able to do business over here. And that's, that's a big advantage that especially international companies get by getting themselves listed. The other is obviously capital. And that, to your point, is uh, access to capital. There is much more avenues to access capital today uh, than there were before, and especially in the tech sector where we invest and we kind of buy acquire companies or fund companies. There is also a value to uh, the strategic secrecy that it provides, where the disclosure requirements, especially of your strategy and the secret sauce, which is why the company is valued, uh, especially in the early stages, is of value to stay private and not go public. And uh, we, we see there's a competitive differentiator because if we are able to get companies where there's a great st strategy, great product, and a great team in there to be able to invest that money. And of course, it helps with the large balance sheets that we carry. Can I now, before we turn to what the consequences of this are, though, ask whether there is actually a downside to these startups staying private until they've become really quite big. And I, let me sort of throw out two. One is that actually the lack of disclosure that you can get away with means that problems get stored up. And you know we can all think of any number of companies where that's clearly been the case. And the second, is there a risk that you have locked in through your series you know, EF or whatever valuations that are kind of crazy valuations in this, in this environment of, of very abundant capital with the result that actually you kind of can't go public because you're massively overvalued? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, that's something we've tried to be very careful of. Um, you know, we've had offers to invest in us at valuations that are significantly higher than than we've we've had before, and and that that's relatively cheap capital for us to take. Um, but the risk is that you get too far over your skis, and I think that you can see a number of high-profile uh, technology companies that have taken very high valuations that just can't be justified by any revenue multiple. 
uh, and 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 that, then they are get stuck in this place where they don't want to do a down round because that creates all kinds of internal uh, just challenges, and they have to wait to grow into whatever that valuation is. And so we've tried to stay very disciplined at at actually sort of taking what we thought of as the as the right valuation. The, the last time we raised money, um, we actually had to talk the valuation down slightly because we had people that were, were proposing things that were crazy. And, and again, that, that seems as, a, as an entrepreneur like a good thing, but if you get too far over your skis, that just creates a trap for you in the long term. Yeah, just I, I think Matthew's dead right on, on this. And, and I think what we've seen happen over the last 10 years is, is a growth, the growth of very complex structures, preferred stock structures, that really create a significant friction. And so it's not, it's valuation is one thing, but if you've got certain terms in the preferred stock, which is typically the form people invest in, uh, it really makes it difficult oftentimes for, for boards and entrepreneurs to make the choice to go public until they can clear a fairly significant valuation hurdle. Yeah, that's something that we don't, we don't that the community doesn't talk about enough is, is the, the terms that you can get any valuation you want if you'll write whatever terms are in that. And a lot of these late stage rounds are putting in terms that have guaranteed IPO prices or the right to you know, some, some sort of uh, debt structure or something else which is involved. You know, we again tried, we said we want just vanilla terms as clean as possible, that's as close idea. to Parapasu with common shareholders. And I think that's then made it so that we can make much more rational decisions where we're very much aligned with what our investors are doing. And how much is the the kind of uh, not only the abundance of capital, but the abundance of capital from from very different sources? So there's the kind of you know the traditional VCs, there's the you know the big corporates getting in now, the sovereign wealth funds. There's you know how big is the SoftBank fund? I mean, it's kind of a hundred billion or something. So there's a lot of money. Is that is that clouding? And I'll, you can give me the founder's perspective in a minute. But from your perspective, is it is it basically clouding everybody's judgment and that there's just you know far too much money being thrown in. I wouldn't go as far as clouding judgment. I'd say it's, you a, it. it's, <laughs> a, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong alternative uh, for, for companies that maybe for good reason want to stay private. I, th I think what was stated about strategy is important. A lot of times companies just don't want their strategy disclosed. So maybe, maybe they don't have the processes and rigor ready to, to deal with quarterly earnings reports. And those are good reasons actually to stay private longer. But what's different now uh, from 20 years ago is that scale capital is available for private companies that wasn't before. I mean, multi-hundred million dollar equity checks for still relatively high risk businesses is, is uh, available. And again, not just from VC private equity, but sovereign wealth funds are active. The vision fund you mentioned from SoftBank, of course, and, and wealthy families. I mean, and, and there's so much interest in getting exposed to technology. A lot of the companies we're talking about are tech companies that uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it abating. How much, Tony, is this a tech-specific phenomenon and a US-specific phenomenon? Or how much do you see the sources of capital and, and availability of capital changing dramatically for, for a company? Well, for me, the source of capital are, are really clearly tech-oriented. Not many people want to invest in airlines. Uh, certainly, I haven't met any in Davos. Except <laughs> <laughs> uh, for Tom. And, uh, if you'll come less. Yeah, exactly. Um, just, just want to cover one point, just from, from an Asian perspective. I don't think there's anyone in Asia Who's work, I mean, everyone would love to listen to New York Stock Exchange, I think, uh, for a variety of reasons, valuation and um, image and brand. And I think no one's worried about the regulatory compliance because, as you as was said, you get the valuation for it anyway, so you, you get it back. It's more the unknown of the litigus, the litigation. That's, that kind of puts us, especially if you're an airline. But going back to your original question, I, don't, I think a lot of the alternative capital is being driven to uh, the, tech the tech side. That's that's where and that's where some of these valuations are coming yep. up. That's where some of these you know big numbers are being thrown out. I don't think it's necessarily and and most of that is U.S. driven. So that's why you're seeing that. So I don't think um, uh, it's uh, an entire industry. I think many many companies in the old industries are still trying to uh, get capital from the IPO markets, etc. And then I, what I see as an interesting phenomenon is that many people are trying to rebrand themselves as tech companies. Um, you know, I, I want to try and say that I'm a tech company. I'm not, a, not an airline anymore. It's going to take me a while. Uh, I just, you know, I, I've got a lot of data. I've got 89 million customers. I've got all that data. Um, Snap, which is a camera company. Exactly. Um, so we, I, I do see that phenomenon coming up. And that, that shows that people are saying, well, how come that Uber's worth this? and we're worth this. 
And I think those are the questions that are being thrown, thrown at the moment. So let's, let's posit for the moment that the trend we've seen in the last few years is going to continue. So broadly, companies listing later, bigger deals, but smaller number of listings, and, and tech having these multiple sources of capital and going to, to IPO later. Is that, you know, where is that going to lead us in terms of the nature of basically capital ownership and capitalism? And what does it mean for the way businesses are run? What does it mean for shareholders? What does it mean for societies at large? And you mentioned short-termism earlier as being one reason that, you know, you were concerned, or the sort of downside of being in the public markets, if you will. Are we going to get, you know, more long-term thinking and better functioning, mark, um, you know, businesses? Or are we going to get, you know, ones that are overvalued and, you know, not don't have proper disclosure? And, you know, your ordinary person doesn't have access to the wealth creation that they're doing because they don't have access to the public markets. You must... I'm dying, that's a lot. I'm dying to pick up on two themes quickly that have been sure. hit. Can I do it? And, yeah. and then I'll answer your question uh, directly. The, the first is you asked, are there negatives of not being public? I, I think the answer is obviously yes. It, you look at some of the high profile public companies, you think of Uber, where Dara came out yesterday and said our moral compass wasn't pointed in the right direction. Well, as a public company, you're answering publicly to shareholders once a quarter. You are required to have a whistleblower hotline. You are required to have independent directors who care deeply about being sued. You think about, other, you think about other private companies right now who are dealing with management turmoil because of bad behavior in the workplace. Again, once every three months going in front of investors having to have a whistleblower hotline. Or finally, you think of Facebook. Facebook showed up at their first earnings call without a mobile strategy and thought that was OK. They weren't all in on mobile. If they had been a private company, their stock would, would not have gone down by, I don't remember, it was enormous, 40%. They've now gotten mobile right and taken over the world. And that was the public market instilling, instilling discipline. Um, because I went a little long on that one, I won't mention the second point, which is there's also a benefit in having a public currency, a stock. Because right now, everything is going great. But eventually, we'll hit a, a rough patch. And Cloudflare, as a public company, will be able to go acquire companies with really great IP using their, their public currency. Um, to answer your question directly, I'm an, I'm an optimist. Again, it sounds like I'm a homer because I run the New York Stock Exchange. I think things are going well. We're having a bang up year already here, coming off a great year last year. We've, we were sitting here 10 years ago, Cloudflare would already be a public company. They're not a public company. So we haven't had a listing fee from them in the past two years. And investors like my father sitting at home in Bowie, Maryland, who doesn't have the wealth or sophistication to get into a hedge fund, hasn't participated, or a venture capital firm, hasn't participated in the wealth creation. Those are both negatives, one personally and one societal, but they're not the end of the world. Things are going pretty well. So I, go ahead. Well, actually, if you, you know, aggregate from your father, there are an awful lot of people who are not in any way taking part in this wealth creation. And so it's, it is, it does mean that the benefits of this enormous wealth creation are accruing to a very, very small number of but, people. Now, uh, but on, well, the, on, I, the, on the flip side, there was a ton of wealth destruction in the dot-com bubble because there was a lot of small technology companies that got public yeah. that shouldn't have, that people invested in. And, and the fidelities of this world are getting into this. Yeah. You know, they're basically investing in private. But yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I think there is, a, is an issue about this uh, from a societal point of view. But I divide it in uh, two categories, individual investors and institutional investors. On the institutional side, which are pension funds and, and other type of institutional investors, um, they are getting access to these private companies. Their allocation of private equity has gone up from 4% to 10%, and it's trillions of dollars of more capital coming in. So many of the beneficiaries of these pension funds around the world are benefiting from, from great companies that we, we all know about. The place I worry more is on the individual investor side in, in, in really two dimensions. One is indexing. There's a ton of capital flowing into indexes, as we know, which is, which is good. But there's a, a shrinking pool of public companies to be indexed against. And I think that's a, that's a negative for those individual investors. And the other thing is, I, I think there was a, the, I think the IPO market and individual participation in the IPO market reinforces the, the, the sense of capitalism being a positive. Because, well, this is great entrepreneur. They started a company like Cloudflare. Yeah. I'm an individual. I get to buy in that stock and watch their success and participate in that success. Makes me feel good about the nature of capitalism and, 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 and wealth creation. Now, I can't be an Airbnb. I can't be an Uber right now. I'd like to be. I use the product. I think that's a place where we're losing something in terms of a whole generation of young people who could become investors and might become more convinced that capitalism is, is a positive. I think, I think it's I agree with it because while the overall prosperity is increasing, the world GDP is increasing, but the happiness index is going down. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and that's the reason, you know, disparity is not good for the society. And again, the democratization of wealth that public markets provide is in a way uh, hindered by not going public. So there is a societal Sorry, issue there. Sorry, I that. Let's open now to questions. But before I do, and this is not something the WEF organizers have I've told them I'm going to do, so it may be very much against the rules, but I wanted to just have a show of hands around the room of how many of you think that the decline in IPOs or the slowing in IPOs that we've talked about, particularly for, for younger companies, is a bad thing, a broadly a negative development? A few of you. OK, that's really interesting. So it's, it's not a, a, a broadly held view that it worries you too much. Now, let's, are there any questions from, from anybody? Yeah. There are mics. So, yes, sorry. I, Is there any relationship between the decline in IPOs and the development of the, the shadow banking, which is the non-banking system, the, like the market-based oh. finance? Bill. I, I mean, most of the shadow banking that people talk about is in China. Um, China uh, does not have a well-developed equity market. Uh, Tom's really comment on this. but um, and Most of the shadow banking is in the US market because it's much bigger. You can see the report of the shadow banking done by the, the uh, I think you mean the broader definition of, of yeah, non-bank financing. So you mean, yeah, you mean? The, the G20 report. On the knee. The stability of the But do you mean basically bond issuance and anything that is non-bank finance? Yeah, it's, everything it's a broader from uh, lending, uh, leasing, uh, credit, non-banking credit. Uh, all those intermediaries, uh, private equity funds, asset managers, uh, hedge funds who lend uh, to, to companies without uh, going through the banking system. So this is a huge finance. It's now reaching $90 trillion globally. Uh, and it's uh, mostly US, China, and Europe, of course. And so I was wondering if there's a relationship, because this, this is all money that is really uh, from peer to peer. And it even includes crowdfunding and other things. So it's, it's money that is really circumventing stock markets. I, I think, if I can rephrase the question, I think there's lots of um, in a different financial systems. Some European banking systems are very <coughs> bank focused, others much less bank focused. They've been less bank focused for a long time, but there have been lots of financial innovations, whether it's you know, private equity innovations, whether it's the VC industry. Often the US was the epicenter of that. Has that been part of the reason the old growth well, of alternative sources of I mean, maybe I, I'm sorry I didn't understand the question. I apologize. But I, I think that, uh, to your point, Zane, the, the US intermediates a lot of capital through the capital market and through the equity market. And it's one of the best things about the US system. Other countries uh, intermediate much more through the banking system. And they, want, and they want to be able to have more regulatory control on that. Neither is good or bad. I just think, again, the strength of, of the US capital market is the fact that the securities market function generally pretty well. Um, other questions? Yes, gentlemen there at the right opposite. Can you talk a little bit about the differences in governance? So one of the arguments was being put forward is that actually, look, you have this great public market with great analysts, they the right questions. I mean, is that really true? I mean, you have kind of people who have very small percentage of your company, maybe they don't care that much. The quality of analyst coverage is patchy, I guess. Is it not better to have one or two very big, very engaged investors? How would you compare the two worlds? Tom, why don't you go with that? That's a great uh, I, question. You know, if there's one thing that I'd proffer about governance as a certainty, it's that we're, we're never, we never have the perfect governance arrangements. And we always have to keep evolving and improving how we think of governance. In fact, I just came from a meeting discussing dual class shares, which is a very hot topic in the, in, the, in the US that you may be familiar with. Um, but essentially, there's some blowback from the buy side in the United States against dual class shares. And some of the index providers have actually said, companies with dual class share settings, we're not going to allow to be in our indexes because we're not entirely certain that they're well governed. It's not a, a view that I hold personally, but just to give you an idea. To answer your question directly, I think having a dispersion of shareholders is a great thing. And having a dispersion of shareholder views, as long as your board is appropriately constructed, you're, that the voices of those shareholders can be heard, and that you're in a transparent, highly regulated system, which I think, by and large, the US gets right. We can always quibble with it, and we can, we can improve it. But I think, by and large, it, we get it right. You know, and I'd, I'd add that the way 
I think the answer is different at different stages in your company. When, when we were three people about the nail salon, you know, governance was, what should we do today? You know, where should we go to lunch, right? Um, <laughs> as, as it, made, it would not have made sense when we raised our first capital for us to have to, and one of the reasons, we never took friends and family money because I didn't want to have to tell 15 different uncles what, you know, what, what we were working on you know, every Thanksgiving. <laughs> and um, and so, you know, as it, it, if we're the boat that's getting ready to sail out into the harbor, the question is, what's the governance structure that makes sense? And I think that you know, we looked at things like dual class stock, and I think most of the time, dual class structures were set up in such a way that sort of believes in this great man theory: the Mark Zuckerberg's a genius, therefore let him completely control the company. Uh, I am not. Mark Zuckerberg, um, and and I, I would actually be very nervous if you know the entire governance was control of the company was was held by me. On the other hand, I think that we're not quite ready for the North Atlantic, and so what's the right governance structure? And I think we did something that was was fairly unique, which was we created a dual class system, but we said every single active employee at Cloudflare gets that second class of shares, and those shares get ten times the voting rights of the other shares. And by doing that, we were trying to signal that the people who are coming to work every day making choices about what we're going to build are the ones that have the biggest vote in what is the future of the company. Now, over time, I think we'll continue to build a bigger and bigger boat. And at some point, we'll be ready for the North Atlantic. And at that point, you know, that structure may not be in place. But I think kind of creative but thoughtful governance structures is a way of better bridging that gap between sort of the late stage private companies and the early stage public companies. Cool. I wanted well, to, yeah, I wanted to, because this gets very close to a point you raised earlier, which we haven't come back to, because the flip side of the right governance structure, uh, or the, mirror, the opposite of it, is the question of short termism that you mm. raised earlier. I mean, to what degree are you worried, and but we'll Tony totally say it first, to, to what degree is, you mentioned the sh what public markets made you worry about short termism. How can you? change that? How can you improve things from your perspective within the public markets? Or what's the right structure that maximizes long-termism, but also maximizes oversight and the right governance? Just, just going back to the question itself, I mean, I find uh, a lot of people hate analyst meetings and uh, all, all the road shows, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, a lot of companies pay a lot of money to these management consultants to give them advice. Um, I found a lot of bright kids, a lot of smart people uh, who focus me, focus me on my strategy, push me, ask me the right questions. Some of them are irritating, let's be real, because we all think we're super brilliant. Um, uh, but it puts you in a position to think and focus. And I've, I found those analyst meetings, I found those questions during calls really good in helping me formalize my strategy. So, you know, you got a much bigger pool of brains working you for free in, in, in some ways, all those research uh, analysts, et cetera. And one of the reasons why you know, we like the NYSC is because the, the research capabilities are in, in America are fantastic. And, and so they push you to the limit. Doesn't solve everyone's quarterly targets. And I think that's one of the issues of the, of the failings of the so public market. how do market. you deal with that? I'm not sure. I mean, just it's communication, really. And it takes time. Um, it takes a lot of time. But I mean, ultimately, People are governed by yearly bonuses and profits and quarterly things. And so getting someone to say, well, I'm going to make Indonesia work in eight years, you know, they stick two fingers up at me and say, well, that's going to help my bonus next year. So that I don't think will ever really solve that. Um, but, you know, it, communication is the best way of looking at it. And I think some of the, the private markets have helped me. I'm saying, well, look at the guys investing in, in Uber. They seem to be, you know, very comfortable that, we can lose billions every year because they have a vision. And, and Amazon has showed the way as well uh, when they were in the private and then they've gone public as well. And when they were public, they continued to invest all their profits in for growth. And so there are some examples we can use. But I still believe that it's, and personally, it's better to have a larger spread of shareholders than one or two guys who, who might have the wrong idea on how your company going in, and then you go down the wrong way. You know, short termism, I think it's not about being a public company drives short termism. The guidance that you give every quarter that you then need to achieve drives the short termism. And I think so there, there are remedies within the existing public market system because the benefits definitely outweigh on 
corporate governance, transparency, all of that, especially for large companies, uh, to be public. And some of the short-termism can be addressed by us, the few things that we do being a public company, which drive short-termism with the management incentives and guidance. And how have you, Matthew, because yeah, you've thought, you must, you've clearly thought about this a lot. How are you going to balance those two? But, so I think one is what we've done in terms of uh, dual class structure. And, and, and you know, there, if you are Mark Zuckerberg uh, and, and you do have control of the company, you can make big bets like buying Instagram or buying what, you know, for a billion dollars, buying WhatsApp for $20 billion. I mean, those are big bets. Um, at least the Instagram bets paid off, you know, handsomely. If he didn't have that control, would it have been as easy for him to make that bet? I'm not sure. Um, again, I, I'm not sure that, that, that I, on my own, know what the right thing is for Cloudflare for sure. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that the people who show up for work every day have a better sense than you know, some hedge fund that's just trading in and out of our stock on a daily basis. I think one thing that's you know, an interesting area to watch is what Eric Ries is doing around the alternative um, uh, listing market with the idea that investors earn a, a voting right over a long-term period of holding the stock. And so you know, I think there's interesting work that's being done here. Um, and some of that's around new governance models. Some of that might be around new, new kind of market structures. Um, but it's, it, it's definitely trying to get the best of the kind of ability to make those big long-term bets like you see a Google or a Facebook do, uh, not be governed by just kind of what we hit that next quarter, um, and, and really, but then at the same time, having the right controls in place that you don't, that you don't see fraudulent or, um, or, or malfeasant behavior. Mm -hmm. no, any other questions? Yes, gentlemen there. I have a question about your views on the direct listing market. Spotify's contemplating it. There's lots, lots of opinion, opinion on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I believe the NYSE allows for direct listing. Do you see it as a positive or a negative? Do you see it as apropos for some companies more than others? So in, in some ways, <laughs> other than the fact that we all use Spotify, <laughs> it's this you know, big famous company, it's, it's, it's a bit of a non-event. We've had, I think, 80 direct listings over the last five years. So it's kind of de rigueur. What's different here is, well, first let me tell you, t a typical direct listing is uh, a company emerging from bankruptcy. Those are almost always direct listings. We had one, Avaya, last week, the, the old phone company, if you're familiar. Um, and, and what a direct listing is, is becoming a public company without raising capital. That's an IPO when you raise capital. Uh, companies emerging out of bankruptcy, OTC upgrades, companies that trade in the kind of pink sheet type markets, or companies that are listed on another exchange that want to come list in, in America. So we do these a lot. What's different here is it's a healthy, uh, thriving company that's direct listing, and so that's got a lot of attention. The actual model is not particularly new, nor do I think it's good or bad. It just, it just is. And you know, Matthew went through, why would I go public as a company? I have unlimited, nearly, he didn't say this, but nearly unlimited access to capital. We have a business that's doing quite well. But you know, when they were over the, the, the nail shop, uh, these were people without husbands and wives, without mortgages, you know, cared less about having current income. All of a sudden, now these people, years later, they do care. You need to be able to create a liquid currency. Sounds familiar to Spotify. Um, and you could imagine a company like that saying, well, geez, if I don't need to raise the dough, why would I raise the dough? If successful, though, what does it mean for the traditional investment bank? Yeah, th and this how will is that a, model evolve? Th this is a, a fun topic in the media to write about. Uh, in reality, we're talking about a tiny, tiny tail of companies that have unlimited access to, to capital uh, that kind of fit in this criteria. I mean, it's maybe two hands, we, we could talk about them. And, and many of those would say, well, geez, I'm going public. I can raise the dough. I will raise the dough, and I'll, I'll save it for a rainy day. So I don't think you're looking at a kind of a paradigm shift where this will be the new, the new model. Um, I suspect uh, you know, others would, would certainly look at it, but it's not going to be the model going forward. Other questions? OK, so I'm going to, because we are coming to the end, I'm, I'm going to have one last look at, because I, th I think you've covered the ground very well of why this is happening. Um, we, we spoke about the regulatory and compliance burns. We spoke about the sources of capital. Uh, we then 
have looked a bit about how to balance short-termism and, and corporate governance and, and ability to think long-term. But let's push a little bit this um, question of what, and when I say the status quo, I don't mean exactly this, this year status quo, but this broad trend that you go to, you go to IPO later and that you have a smaller number of big public companies rather than a lot of very small ones. What does that mean? You, you talked a bit about what it meant for society in terms of people not feeling they were, they were part of the big, exciting new companies. How problematic is that? Is that just something we'll talk about at Davos? Or is it actually going to become a problem for the underlying social sort of acceptance of capitalism, the, the people? Because they will be part of it through institutional investors, as you said. Yeah, but I think, personally, my view is that people do look at, you know, are these companies making a few billionaires or many millionaires? And, you know, the society is more accepting of a larger set of millionaires than a few billionaires. And I think that is where uh, okay. there is merit in you know, ac accessing the public market in a retail. So does this become part of the broader sort of tech lash, backlash, that people think this is, you know, a whole set of innovation that's benefiting a few people and not broadly, and this is one aspect of that? Well, I, I think maybe on the margin, because the companies you're going to see go public are going to already very often now be established leaders. It, it, there was a day when the small cap IPO, you were kind of rooting for the little guy to compete against an Amazon or someone like that, and they were coming into the market. There's less of that now. I mean, more of the, the companies are coming out. It, they've, they've won their market, like a Spotify, for, for example. Um, so, so I think there may be some men on the margin. I, I think I, I'm not as worried about the, the whole thing. I, I mean, if you, again, even if you take a global view, I mean, last year, $145 billion of proceeds raised for global IPOs, you know, up uh, 30%, you know, very, very, very positive years. Cap capital formation is happening. Companies that need to access capital are getting it uh, through the public markets. Um, I think governance generally has improved dramatically in the over 20 years I've been doing this, I think the public markets has enfor have enforced the discipline. You know, the New York Stock Exchange has been a leader in pushing for corporate governance, as have many asset managers. So I, I, I'm, I'm more optimistic. So you're optimistic. Yeah. Excellent. Well, let's, that's a very good note to end on. But before, I want all five of you to come up with one concrete prediction. And we've got lots of, <laughs> lots of you here who can come up with very concrete ones. So with you, I can ask what, which big companies that are going to IPO in the next, let's say, two years that we should look out for? Airbnb. OK. What's going to be, well, you can answer the same question if you like, but also who, who else, who are the target companies for companies like yours to buy now? Who are the next big ones of the sorts that you can <laughs> De Definitely tell com us. <laughs> com companies who are very innovative and more, more important for us is there is a higher synergy value than the standalone value of those companies. So that would be companies like... They avoided that. the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, no, I, no, but so, so, you know, you talked earlier about it. We didn't kind of elaborate on it. You, there's a le level of clouding, that you, the word that you use, which essentially yes. is that the valuation of some of those companies in private funding or alternate funding are seemingly higher yeah. than when they go on a public fund. And the reason is because when a large investor buys that company, the value that they see from their context in those companies is relatively higher than what a a public listing would see on a, on a standalone basis. And that's going to continue, that people, that's because, in a, because of the sort of pace of technological change, people see right. specific technologies or specific that they're willing to pay above the odds for. Absolutely, because the, the synergy effect is much bigger and people are willing to pay for that synergy effect. I'm going to have to ask you, so what, are, you going to, are you going to do him a favor and list on the New York Stock Exchange? Well, I think okay. he's doing me a favor. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're both my, to each other. Uh, no, you, I, I'd you know, love to. Davos is all about doing deals. You no, could, no, you know. I, no, I'd love to. I think nothing, I'm a big believer in the public markets. There are obviously some flaws. I wouldn't be where I was without the public market. And uh, I think there's more pluses than minus. I don't think a lot's going to change. And I think we've got a unique situation with this tech world. And so hopefully one day I'll be pressing the bell with uh, or Gong or whatever he chooses. Need to press um, at the New York Stock Exchange. And a, lot of, a lot of my friends are in the room on the stage that run private companies. They would all say, I've never pressured anybody or suggested, you should hurry up and do an IPO. What I'm pushing him is, when you're ready, when you're ready, do it with us. You know, it's, up to <laughs> it's a big difference. There's a big difference between the two. So you, yeah, you don't, you, 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 uh, you don't get out of my specific question. So what's going to be uh, the, your, you know, the, the IPO, your most exciting IPO this year, what are you really hoping for? Uh, well, 
We actually have the uh, uh, right now, uh, as 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 we sit here, the largest Latin American technology IPO ever is pricing on the floor of the stock exchange, which is really exciting. It's a Brazilian payments company. They raised two point three billion dollars last night. So that in and of itself is fun. We had one of our one of the guests here mentioned. Uh, uh, Spotify uh, uh, direct listing, if that if that comes to pass, and then the ones that are mentioned in the press a lot is happening within the next two, two years. I think the companies uh, Airbnb, Uber, and Saudi Aramco have all said they intend to IPO. I was in the going next to two mention years, Aramco so. if you yeah. didn't. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm I'm like anyone, you know, a, a big you're fun IPO with geopolitical list? involvement. It's it's absolutely uh, fun. What's that? I said you're confident that you're going to get Saudi Aramco to list on the NYC. I didn't say that. I just said, <laughs> you asked which IPOs am I excited to kind of be a part of and watch, and, that, and that's one of them. And I think, obviously, I have to ask you, having we've just had a whole hour talking about IPOs, when's it going to happen? So my, my legal counsel told me I can't answer that, so I'll answer a different question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think two big trends that could be sort of bit flip changes, not necessarily could be big bit flip changes, to watch. One. China doesn't yet have a sophisticated equity market, but they want one desperately. And there's a lot of pressure from the government on Chinese companies to move back home. And so I think that's one thing to watch that could really change US equity markets and other world equity markets. The second thing, which is more short term, uh, is that the repatriation of cash that is being created by the change in tax policy is going to put an enormous amount of cash on the balance sheets of large tech companies that are already public. And there are really only a handful of things that they can do with that cash. They can invest in R&D. They can dividend it out. Uh, they can buy back their own shares, or they can go buy other companies. <coughs> The answer is they'll do a little bit of all four of those things. Uh, and the process of them going out and using that capital, that could change how some of the later stage uh, tech companies that are thinking about an IPO, that they might see that as an attractive, uh, attractive option, especially if that pushes value. So you get bought up. by Apple rather than doing an IPO? Never know. I think with that, and just to make be clear that I understood on the Chinese point, which is a really interesting point, you're talking about companies like Alibaba, the ones that are listing outside of <coughs> China now going back. Well, that is a tantalizing point to end on, but I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. Thank you all very much indeed. That was a really, Thank really you. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.